Hello, and welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith featuring Gretchen Felker Martin and Carmen Maria Machado to discuss Gretchen's new novel, Manhunt, an explosive post apocalyptic novel that follows trans women and men on a grotesque journey of survival. Uh, my name is Adam Shuhos, and I'm a bookseller and events host at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, whether you know us well or this is your first time hearing our name, thank you so much for being part of our community today. And thank you so much for supporting an independent bookstore through your book purchases and for supporting the wonderful work of Gretchen Felker Martin. Now, I first want to thank our moderator, uh, Carmen Maria Machado, for being here tonight. Carmen is the author of the best selling memoir, In the Dream House, and the award winning short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties. Her essays, fiction, and criticism have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Vogue, This American Life, and elsewhere. Thank you so much for being here, Carmen. Thank you for having me. And of course, our guest star for this evening, Gretchen Felker Martin, is a, Ma is a Massachusetts based horror author and film critic. You can follow her work on Twitter at uh, Scumbelievable and read her fiction and film criticism on Patreon and at Nylon, The Outline, Fanbyte, and more. It's a joy to say, please join me in welcoming Carmen Maria Machado and Gretchen Felker Martin. I'm looking at the comments down below as they're coming in and they're really cute. They're so nice. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, hello. Um, uh, happy Manhunt Day. I saw a couple of those, which I love. Um, yeah, day. Someone made a meme of um, the Muppet Christmas Carol where they're all shouting that it's Manhunt Day at Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, okay, well, let's get started. Um, yeah, and just a reminder, everybody, yeah, if you want to throw some questions into the chat, I might peek at it a little bit during the talk. If there's anything relevant, I might kind of bring it into the discussion. And then, of course, we're going to have a Q&A at the end. But please feel free to drop things in the Q&A whenever. Um, okay, so I was just, as I was just telling you before this started, um, I was rereading Manhunt. So I first read Manhunt last year when you sent it to me and I read it in one sitting, sitting outside, <laughs> getting eaten alive by mosquitoes and I didn't even care because I was just so completely riveted by it. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to reread it and to revisit it. Um, so I guess I just wanted to first talk about the beginnings of this project, the influences, obviously, you know, this sort of exists in like, um, th there's like sort of a genre, right? A subgenre of like these kinds of post-apocalyptic narratives circling around gender. And like, obviously this book is sort of like in evolution of them, but it's also like part of that. I don't, I, so I, I wanted to sort of know like what your inspiration for the book was, like how you feel like it exists in this space and these genres um, and your influences, like the people that you feel like the read, the, the writing, the films and the, and the, um, the books that have brought you here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think the single biggest influence on the story is probably Alice Sheldon's The Screwfly Solution. Uh, which is a story about an unknown disease or force that suddenly causes all men on the planet to attack and murder the women around them. Um, and it's an incredibly insightful, fascinating story. It delves really, really deeply into its particular setting, which is sort of upper middle class cishet relationships, you know, like the nuclear family, the suburbs. And it's, it's very intentional. It's targeted at that. But that means that in the background of that story, there are millions and millions of people who you have no way of knowing what their experiences are. And the minute I heard it, I thought I could do so much in that, like in that blank space. Mm -hmm. Other big influences that I would say are uh, Tori Peters' Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones, which is one of my favorite novels. Um, Stephen King's The Stand, also a big one. I'm, I'm a huge Stephen King fan, have been my whole life. Um, 28 Days Later is a movie that, that comes to mind a lot when I'm doing this because it's this movie that on the surface is sort of survivalist and action driven but then one level deeper you have all these disturbing commentaries on gender roles yeah you know it's, it's very concerned with like sexual availability and punitive womanhood yeah 
Yeah. I actually remember the first time I ever saw that movie. Cause when did that movie come out? Was that like 2000, it was like 2000s, right? It was, the, I think it was the late 2000s, like 2006, 2008. Yeah. I feel like I saw it like maybe in college or a little after. And I remember like watching that and, and there was something about that, which actually now as I'm saying it is in your novel as well, which is like the moment where they're like in this like camp or whatever. Um, and at some point you realize the camp is more dangerous than the like apocalyptic yeah. blighted zombie soaked landscape, like outside of the, the parameters of this place. Um, and I feel like at the moment at that time I had sort of a very like silly epiphany, like people are the monsters. Like, <laughs> like I was like very excited, you know, but yeah, like the, like so much of that, I can see that in this, in this novel as well. Um, where it's like not clear what's scarier the men or the turfs that are like militarized, like these military turfs that sort of exist all over. Yeah. 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 I think to me, that's sort of been the story of my journey into adulthood is like having grown up on this feminist idea that men are the most dangerous and that there is sort of this ongoing gender war, you know, like first wave feminist stuff mm -hmm. and, and second wave to an extent. And then discovering like, well, really the systems that happen to have been laid down and created and monopolized by men are what's dangerous. And when you replace men with women in those systems, women behave identically. Yeah. This, yeah, I don't want to spoil anything, but I do feel like there's a moment of the novel where like you you sort of very, like Fran actively has this realization, right? Like they look like that there's this idea that like this these, this is men is like these systems, yeah. um, which I remember f finding that like just being completely like blown away by that and like knocked over by that uh, when I read it the first time and the second time. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, you wrote this really incredible piece for Autostraddle that I read yesterday, I think, about what it was like to write Can you, oh, can you hear me? Am I back? Oh, no. Oh, oh no. there you are. Oh, there I am. Okay. Oh, sorry. I just got my like internet is unstable. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Sorry. You look, you look so worried. I was like, is my question. Oh, right. Okay. You just can't hear me. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, you wrote this amazing piece for Autostraddle about writing a turf character, right? So writing inside of the head of this like truly odious woman. Um, and I, I mean, I know you sort of wrote about it, but I also just wanted you to kind of talk about like the process of getting inside of the head of this person, not just like a terrible person, but like a person who is like, who like actively wants to do harm. Right. And so there was something really interesting about that process. And I wanted to just have you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have been unwillingly exposed to turf abuse and rhetoric since I was anything of a public figure at all, and, and even before, honestly. And I think that if I had just cut and pasted things that real turf say into this book, it would have been completely unbelievable and impossible to read because they're so one dimensional. I mean, they're, they're unwell. They rant endlessly about exactly one thing until their lives literally implode around them. It, there's a lot in fiction that you can't do in spite of it being an accurate reflection of reality. Um, so that was, that was the first hurdle really was trying to find a way to give these women depth and to, to bring that out of them. Because I do think it's there, it's just not immediately apparent. Mm -hmm. And so with Ramona, who is this sort of ambivalent member of this fascist military organization, who also has a, a trans lover on the side, what I eventually found as the hook was a sort of moral laziness that I think is underexplored in fiction. There's this willingness to be whatever is around you, to do whatever is advantageous or gratifying to you in the moment, 
not as like some big Machiavellian plan, but just as a way of moving through the world. I think that the majority of collaborators and members of, of fascist governments throughout history have, have been this way. And that it's more interesting than someone who is like an overt and driven monster is someone who just doesn't have the spine to stand up and say, this is wrong. Yeah. And the other reason that I, I, I wrote this woman in this way and that I, I gave her the arc that I gave her was I was so incredibly sick of seeing stories where someone hugged a Nazi until they got nicer. I think that there's a real unwillingness to grapple with the fact that some people have chosen to be fundamentally mm -hmm. okay with the extermination of whole groups. Yeah. Um, on the most recent reread of this novel, I was really marveling over, it's going to sound weird, but like the action sequences, um, as somebody who struggles with action sequences personally, um, uh, I find, I found them so, because they were so unbelievably violent and so beautiful and they just it felt like I was watching like a dance or a ballet or like reading it like a dance or a ballet but I sort of could follow it in this way that was it was as if I was like watching it in front of me and it was really incredible um what is the process like of writing like action sequences sequences with like guns and bows and arrows and military ships and like advancing hordes like the sort of these like I don't know the orchestration I guess of those types of scenes <sighs> It's funny because those are scenes that I really struggle to write. Okay. <laughs> it's not like where my interest lies. I have to put a lot of time into it. I typically only do it a few times a book. Um, but fortunately, I'm a professional movie critic and I've seen thousands of movies <laughs> on television. And if you have a combination of Breaking Bad and heist movies like Rafifi and, you know, the, the writing of George R. R. Martin to draw on, you can get a good sense for what works in an action context. You, for instance, you could watch the famous scene in the, the later seasons of Breaking Bad where they rob a train and it's just like, you could turn the whole thing at any moment on a dime. Mm -hmm. It's so tense. It's so beautifully almost choreographed. And so I try to kind of reverse engineer that. Like I think intentionally, where is the director putting these characters in relation to each other? How is that being communicated to the viewer? What does that mean about the timeline of possible events? And that's sort of, that's how you weld an action sequence together. And then on top of that, you have to give the reader emotional immediacy. You have to make them feel like they are stumbling down the edge of a ditch and they're going to break their wrist on the rocks in the bottom of a river. You've got to put the camera right up on them. Yeah. Um, someone has mentioned in the chat, they want to know if there are any action sequences in movies that you particularly love or that you recommend. Absolutely. Um, I would say the famous one -er toward the end of Alfonso Cuaron's Children of Men, mm. where in a single uninterrupted take, we travel through an entire war-torn city following mm. a protagonist who is not armed. And it is, it is one of the most harrowing things you will ever seen you will ever see, apologize. Um, the other big recommendation I would put out is a selection of action sequences from the television adaptation of Game of Thrones. Mm. I would especially suggest Blackwater from season two, The Battle of the Bastards from I believe season five or six, and uh, The Long Night from the mm -hmm. final season. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These are sequences that really show you what it means to put people that the reader cares about deeply in mortal danger 
yeah. sometimes in mutually exclusive ways. I mean, when you start these kind of big sweeping action scenes in a book with a large cast, you may have characters on both sides that the reader feels connected to. And it makes it so much more real and so much more tense because that's war in the real world. Mm -hmm. Everyone is, is someone's loved one. And it's, it's the ultimate violation of human connection when people kill each other. Yeah. You're, you're severing indiscriminately the strands of someone else's life and you've never even met them. Yeah. I want to talk about Children of Men for just a second because it is one of my favorite movies in the whole world. Um, and as that was also like really informative for me when writing my first, when writing a story in my first book. Um, uh, yeah, could you, I don't know, do you want to talk about Children of Men for a second? Just how I'm, fucking good it is. It's such a good movie. <laughs> It's yeah. so bleak. It's so like tragically sexy for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And it, it has no interest in giving you a comfortable experience. Like it's so bleak. I mean, like some of the, like the way I remember it also being another like early film experience for me where like somebody I liked got killed really quickly. And I was like, exactly what I was thinking super fun. I was just like, wait. And I was like, she must be alive because they wouldn't like kill her off that quickly. Like, right. And then just being like really fucked up about it for the rest of the movie. Yeah. yeah. I remember a similar experience with 28 days later um they my favorite character dies not long after he's introduced and i was devastated yeah i, I think that it, it has become kind of a, a storytelling cliche to kill off your main character yeah but, uh, but it's really it's really unnerving it's yeah, it's such an interesting technique and it really, I remember being like profoundly unnerved by it as like a movie viewer when I first saw that movie. Um, uh, Easton, the story Inventory, is just, it's a pandemic story, but I, I remember like Children of Men being really formative for me in terms of um, foregrounding and backgrounding, like thinking about like, like world building and like there are really, there's so many good moments in Children of Men, a lot of which is like aided by cinematography, which is like like there's that, t there's that scene where like they're having the conversation at the like safe house and um, like the protagonist is like kind of listening and there's a kitten trying to like climb up the leg, the pant leg of his pants. So the camera kind of like goes down and like you can hear them talking about this like very important stuff, but there's like a kitten trying to climb up his pants and he's like focused on the kitten. And it's just these like really beautiful sort of moments of world building and like character building that are happening in this like back and forth way that feels very like cinematic to me. And I think was just like really instructive what I was thinking about what it means to write a story that had like, you know, a big thing happening in the background and like a person just trying to live their stupid fucking life in the foreground. Absolutely. You know? um, life has patience for you. Things yeah. that are not the narrative are going to be happening constantly. I remember um, I was asked why The Sopranos is my favorite show of all time. And what I said was because it never does the minimum. Yeah. They're not just going to convey information to you. They're going to have an old man in Mr. Magoo glasses shouted at you while in his bathrobe. Like, <laughs> you're, you're going to see human life, which is absurd and pathetic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, I feel like, I feel like there was one more question in the chat. If you guys have questions, make sure to put them in the Q and A. Cause I, I can only, I can't really super follow the chat um excellent okay children of men Oof, so good um oh I actually and someone had a related question um they said Carmen's remark about your skill with action scenes reminds me of how difficult sex scenes can be to write which I agree I feel like they're very similar in a lot of ways it's like what's what's here yeah. what's there um uh can you share your process of approaching the construction of sexually intimate scenes like the ones in Manhunt absolutely um Mom, dad, if you're at this event, please cover your ears now. <laughs> so when I want to write a sex scene, it is very similar to the ethos behind writing an action scene. You want to bring the viewer into it. And I think that the best way to do this is always to write about something that moves you personally. I mean, not to be crude, but something you can get off to or that you can at least understand on an intellectual level oh i think we lost carmen we 
I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can okay. hear you. Can you? Oh, I'm listening. I heard you perfectly clearly. You're, you can keep going. I can, yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you want to bring the viewer into this experience into a sense of immediacy with the bodies of these characters, with their emotions. I think that the best way you can write an honest and beautiful and open sex scene is to consider everything you've ever thought and haven't said while you were having sex, while you were being desired, everything you've felt about your own body, about your lover's body, something that was really important to me while I was writing this book was my first time with another trans woman, um, which was not too long after I came out. And I remember realizing that I loved things about her body that I hated about mine. And it's, it's such a powerful experience to encounter that, especially when you have a deviant body in the eyes of society. I think that sex deserves just as much attention, if not more than any kind of, of action and suspense, any kind of, any kind of thrill. People navigate the world sexually in part. And, and so, so do my characters. I can't imagine writing characters who don't have and want and think about sex all the time. Yeah. I mean, it seems true on just like, even just like a plot level, which is like, what else would you do at the end of the world? Right? Like I would, that's certainly what right. I would be doing. I don't know what else would be doing. But, um, but also, yeah, like, it's just like, right. It's so much of it, of the human experience that it just feels really natural. And I feel like I always appreciate that when I feel like sex is being like, it's like, yes, this is the kind of sex that like people have. And it's like sex, it's like happening with the frequency that I would expect. Um, like that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I think like if the, the world were burning down even more than it currently is, what else is there even to do? Totally, totally. Ex yeah, I completely agree. Um, that thing that you said, sorry, this thing is, is blowing my mind. They said everything you've thought and not said during sex is like just really like, res it's just like rocketing around in my brain. I love that so much. Um, it's funny because I also feel like I have this, like I do, I do have this habit of like writing about the sex, like, like thinking about, right, like my own, you know, like moments of my own sort of like surprise and delight and joy and fear and like all the things that sort of can accompany it and like how that becomes like so much a part of these scenes. Um, and you get to like draw on these experiences and it can be this really like really interesting process. Um, oh, I love that. Um, okay. Um, Do, okay, sorry, I'm just making sure there's no questions that I want to talk about. I already have to talk about writing sex. Check that off my list. <laughs> um, I guess on the sort of the, 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 the sort of question of violence, somebody has asked, some who read and write extreme horror fiction respond to the extremity by deadening their sensitivity um, Um, how do you sort of work with the ghastly and extreme without desensitizing? Is it necessary to find a balance? And if so, how? I do think you need to let yourself rest sometimes. I mean, before I signed on tonight, I was watching Frasier and snuggling my cat. So it's, it's not like I'm sitting here just watching an unending feed of <laughs> yeah. And, like, yeah. it's not Cannibal Holocaust 24 <laughs> seven. I think that actually taken in the appropriate dosage, so to speak, that kind of art can make you more sensitive. Mm -hmm. It can open you up and make you vulnerable. You're seeing human beings at their most wretched and abject and inevitably you empathize with those experiences. You start to get a sense of, of what they look like and by extension, how they feel like it's a way that you can press yourself up against discomfort and come to understand yourself better. So I would say 
do push yourself to watch Cannibal Holocaust, but unwind with Fraser after. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's really good advice. Um, that's amazing. Um, so you run a film series. I do. Um, and uh, called Deadlight, and I be- and it, it is one does it through your Patreon, yes, which I also want to plug. Um, so if any of y'all are not supporting Gretchen on Patreon, you, you should. Um, can you, and obviously like your professional film critic, I mean, you've written just ex- wonderful, I mean, like I'm just, everything you write about film, I like devour it. I'm so interested in it. Um, so can you talk a little bit just about your relationship with film as its influence on your work? Um, do you ever imagine writing film or have you, or are you going to, or can you just talk about, I guess the relationship between like prose and, and film? Absolutely. Um, So I have been really into movies basically my whole life. I remember when we were, when I was maybe 13 or 14, we got the the old Netflix subscription where they would send you DVDs in the mail. Uh, uh, (laughs) R.I.P. Can you still get that? Like, I I still, I don't think so i think that's done i think that's gone forever oh um, apparently according to our chat oh really oh well that's oh well, i do i remember getting those dvds in the mail oh my god it was the most exciting thing in the world it was so it great was. yeah <laughs> and that's how i watched the sopranos for the first time that's how i watched Mad Men. that's how i watched breaking bad and i started to get really into the idea of like watching all these classic films. So here's little like 15 year old Gretchen watching Citizen Kane and the Godfather movies and like fumbling her way through Alien and The Thing. And it's never, it's never gone away from me. Um, I was lucky enough after college to befriend a a really, really knowledgeable cinephile um, my late friend Danny Thompson, who's a huge, huge influence on my taste and exposed me to Billy Wilder and just an enormous number of foreign films and classic American films. And I feel like having a really, really broad base of exposure has been great for me as a writer. I think that there's nothing better you can have than a developed sense of taste. And you can only develop a sense of taste by taking things in critically. In that sense, being a critic, writing about everything that I watch has been so useful to me, even when I would much rather just sit and watch a movie. Mm -hmm. Because you have to force your own thoughts and perceptions through this critical mold you have to look at your own reactions and think like, am I meeting the movie where it is? Am I accurately gauging what the director is trying to communicate to me? Am I understanding the visual language of how I'm being shown each image? There's there's no end to, to what you can learn from movies. I would love to, to write a movie. I have a few script ideas that I'm, I'm working on with a couple of friends of mine. Um, Annie Rose Malamet is one of them. She is a fantastic, absolutely astonishing critic in her own right. Um, everyone find her on Twitter. She's Girls Guts and Giallo. Um, and the other one I'm working on with, with my friend and longtime editor, Merritt Kay. But this is all, this is all for, for down the road. Um, right now I'm way too busy to think about writing a movie. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm putting it out into the universe because I would love to watch a movie that you wrote. I would, that would make me so ha- fucking happy. Um, it's very exciting. Um, so I want to, I think I'm going to start asking some of the questions from the chat because there are some really good ones. Um, Gian says, I feel like both the dream house <clears throat> in the dream house and manhunt are unflinching depictions of the way cis white women are invested, if not more so as cis white men 
about upholding the power structures of white supremacy that are pre uh, predicated on the suffering of people of color and trans folks. Um, would the two of you be willing to share the spectrum of responses you've received from cis white women as part of your audience? That is a really interesting question. That's a, that is a great question. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Gianna's a really close friend of mine. Um, she's brilliant. I would, I would say that there has been a very broad range of reactions from cis women to Manhattan. Some of them are really enthusiastic and accepting, and this, this closely mirrors the the cis women in my life who have opened up immediately and been sisters to me and have never been weird about my being trans. And I, I love them, they're very important to me. They were crucial to my understanding how to present myself as a woman. Um, my best friend, Julia Grafer taught me and still teaches me so much about makeup and fashion and that like, those things which can seem kind of superficial are, are really important to my understanding myself and being understood the way that I want to. There are also women who make a huge production out of how, oh, oh, this book really isn't aimed at me. It's not for me. Everyone should listen to, to the trans voices who are talking about it, but I just personally thought it was so aggressive and ugly and, you know, it, it, it gets very, very dog whistly. You can hear the neighborhood dogs putting their ears up. <laughs> um, and that's, that's unfortunate. Maybe they'll grow out of it. I think that there is a real tendency among cis women to encounter trans women's work in a very uncharitable light to approach it as though it were physically dangerous. And all I have to say to, to anyone who has had those feelings in their own heart, maybe sit and think about it. <laughs> there is also, of course, the turf response to the book. And in all fairness, this is a book in which a trans woman stomps a turf skull in with her work boots, so you're entitled to be mad. But I really, I really only have one thing to say to them. Um. <laughs> um, uh, Consuelo asks, is Manhunt being published at just the right time or too soon or too late? I think it's just the right moment. Mm -hmm. I... Last year, we had the, the enormous breakout success of Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. Tori is one of my favorite authors and people. And that book went so wide and got into so many places that no one could ever have guessed it would have gone. Not because Tori isn't a genius, she is, but just because traditionally the market is, is not open to non-memoir trans fiction. And I think that is about to change in a very big way. I think that I'm very, very lucky to be right at the right at the crest of the wave. But I think next year, you or someone else as, as well-known and talented and influential as you will be sitting here interviewing someone completely different from me. Uh, I hope in, in many ways, I, I hope that next year there are 20 events like this with trans women authors. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's terribly unrealistic. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do feel like in the last couple of years, like the, the books that I've been the most excited about have actually, like books that have come across just in the wild have been like trans writers. So it's, I, I also hope that as well. I hope there are so many that there's like a dozen every night and we, we can't possibly attend them all because there's just so many. That's exactly what I want. <laughs> um, Joseph asks, um, I found Teach to be such an interesting character. We don't see her below the surface much, but when we do see, we do see the emotions that sustain her ideology. Can you speak to that character? Absolutely. Um, 
physically, the appearance of Teach is based on Elizabeth Holmes, um, the, the big intense eyes, the purposefully deepened voice, the lack of blinking. And I did that because Elizabeth Holmes is someone who took her woman's body and intentionally through rigorous self-training turned herself into this magnetic figure. It's very culty and it had a cult-like result. The other big inspiration for Teach is Jordan Peterson, um, mm. who I learned years ago, lives in a house that is completely full of communist art that he hates, that stresses him out horribly. <laughs> and he does this so that he's always reminded of, of his ideological enemy or whatever. But to me, it's like, you know, I have a terrible cat allergy and so I've chosen to adopt 500 cats so that I will never forget. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's deranged and he has defined himself in his life almost entirely by what he despises and what he wants to crush and kill. And that is TERFs and that is Teach. Her whole world is these women with, which, with whom she is so all consumingly obsessed in the way that TERFs are in real life, her whole office is full of printed out selfies of trans women. It's full of trans art, some of which is, is based on real paintings. Um, in her own way, I think she's much more invested in the idea of trans women as a discrete group than even trans women are. Mm -hmm. And it all stems from incredibly petty slights in her own life that she was incapable of dealing with emotionally. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's pretty amazing when you do get that like one scene in her mind and you see, you're like, that's it? That's the thing that's like really fun. Like that's super fun. Like it's, I mean, not that anything would be an appropriate response, but like it is actually really shocking. Like how stupid it is so you're just like real yeah um I did not know the detail about Jordan Peterson and that makes that scene even that makes that whole detail like that's a great incredibly fucked up detail and I really love that um bizarre, man. yeah oh god um okay oh so many questions oh my god oh my god oh my god okay <laughs> um um, oh, Dana asked, or Dana, Dana, can you speak to your depiction of female friendship, specifically trans friendship in Manhunt? Um, the incredibly true to life mix of jealousy and adoration spoke to me so deeply. Yeah, thank you. That's, um, that's a really thoughtful question. That's really personal for me, as I, as I depicted in the book as well. I think that so often trans women spend so much time thinking about who we want to become, what we want to look like, what we want our lives to be. So many of us are catching up and making up for lost time and coming to know ourselves only as adults. It can be very intense and not always in a, in a productive or healthy way to form a deep bond with someone else who's going through something that, that, is, that is that psychologically taxing and all encompassing. There's nothing on the world, in the world that I would trade for my relationships with the trans women in my life. It has been the most rewarding source of love and support and community that I've ever experienced. But there's a lot of difficulty inherent in it too. We are all stuck in the same gutter. We all have to survive on the same meager social resources. After protracted research, I discovered that I am the first out trans woman to have a major horror release in history. What does that tell you about all the trans artists who are, are struggling and producing work in silence, unseen. How could jealousy not come up in situations where there, there isn't even close to enough to go around? And then on top of that, you have issues of beauty and, and passing. 
when you're trying to build a coherent sense of self, when you're trying to develop a, a good relationship with your appearance and with the way that you understand others seeing you, seeing someone else who is closer to your idea of what beauty is, is so, so difficult to, to integrate into your life. So on the one hand, it's one of the most profound bonds you can experience. You have this enormous ocean of shared experiences and these granular little thoughts that only you can understand. And on the other, it's kind of a wasteland and all we have is each other. And that's not always good. It doesn't always feel good. Um, Claire, uh, says having interviewed you and having read a lot of your interviews leading up to this release, you would ask so many questions. Um, so I'll ask you a silly goose question. If you could write a nonfiction book about anyone, who would it be? Oh, that's actually easy. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I would write about, uh, Nero's wife, Sporo, who was a castrated young man who was with Nero throughout the entire latter portion of his life and who very gently and lovingly assisted in Nero's suicide after he was ousted from the throne. Um, he then went on to serve as a mistress to the next emperor and to several very prominent Roman politicians there's this tradition in ancient Rome of the, the puer delicatus, which means the, the beautiful boy, the delicate boy. And it's a boy who is considered so feminine and of such surpassing beauty that they're castrated before they can go through puberty. And then they're sort of treated as a, a sort of woman socially and romantically and sexually by their masters. And this is something that like, I mean, you're never going to see this in a movie by Ridley Scott or anything. Um, but it's an ineradicable and inextricable part of the ancient world. And it's part of our heritage, too. We, we say we've always been here. We really have. Mm -hmm. You can find us if you dig deep enough. I mean, one of us sat next to an emperor. That's not a small thing. <laughs> no, yeah, oh, I love that. Um, uh, do, 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 um, try to put these in sort of an order, let's see. Um, when working on horror like Manhunt or a trauma narrative like Dreamhouse, what are moments of queer joy for you, either, either in the writing process itself or completely outside of it? This is uh, Elaine who asked this. I just want to take a second, first of all, to say that, I mean, I, I've told you this, but in front of everyone, In the Dream House is one of my favorite novels. I cried like at least five or six times reading it. It's such, <sighs> I wish I didn't get it, but I really, really fucking get it. Um, <laughs> yeah I would say that for me when I'm, I'm working on trans or queer horror that's really rough and long you know I, I was working on Manhunt for over a year <sighs> queer joy for me is of course my, my queer family my friends my lovers my actual family my sibling is trans too um, and we're very close. I think it's really important to keep your community close when you're doing this kind of difficult, emotionally taxing work. Within the text, I think that it makes moments of joy and togetherness and ease really sing if they're surrounded by, by struggle and pain. The example I always think of is um, Robert Eggers' first film, The Witch, which 
shows you this family completely dissolving under the strain of their excommunication from the uh, pilgrim colonies in Massachusetts Bay. And it would be harrowing on its own, but first they show you how deeply and fundamentally these people love each other. And that makes it so much worse. Mm -hmm. If you wanna break something in front of someone and have it matter, you have to show them why they shouldn't want it broken. Yeah. There's a moment in Manhunt, I don't wanna to take too much, again, to avoid spoilers, people who haven't read it yet or haven't finished it yet, but there's a moment where there's like, a bunch of people together and someone's knitting and there's like a cat and I was like oh it's like this what it's like this in, in this book which is just like such a relentless like, <laughs> like that book this book is so intense in so many ways it was just like brief pause like the, the eye of the hurricane and it was like it's like a really beautiful scene of like queer community that um I just found really lovely and was just noticing this this time around um, thank you so much yeah that's that's what that is that's and that's what we have in life you know we have we have the moments between legislative pushes to make it illegal for us to exist yeah. and we have to find happiness there because there's nothing else yeah yeah um I can say also to that question that I, as somebody who, when I was working on my memoir was quite stupid about keeping people around me because I was like, I need to go off and write this and did sort of the opposite of what you did. And it was quite a bad idea. So <laughs> I feel like another point in that column for keeping your queer community close to you when you were writing hard things, um, very important, super necessary. Don't do what I did. I was very stupid. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, do, 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 um, I'm getting a lot of questions that are like, are other books by trans women that you would recommend or that are coming out, that are coming out soon, other horror novels you'd recommend that are coming out soon, like people asking for recommendations of stuff that's out recently or is coming out. Absolutely. I have a, a good slate. First and foremost, you should be reading Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumpet which is a haunted house story that sublimates the entire generational colonial rot of the United Kingdom into one house. It will blow your mind. Um, and I think actually Nightfire picked up the American distribution rights. So that'll be out soon here, but it's, um, I was lucky enough to get to read it early and it broke my heart. I will also say Joe Koch's The Wingspan of Severed Hands, I'm in the middle of, and it is just so genuinely impressive. It's so lush and gothic and exciting and repulsive. It's so gross. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a big fan of Eric LaRocca's work. Uh, I just finished Things have gotten worse since we last spoke, which again is like this very sort of affected, almost modern Gothic kind of prose about a lesbian relationship between two very odd women that goes to a place that you will both see coming and never in a million <laughs> years predict the particulars of. So surprising yet inevitable, I believe is what they call that. <laughs> um, other than that, I'm afraid I'm drawing a blank at the moment, but three's a good number. No, that's a great, oh my God, I've written down all of them and I'm very excited. I think I saw you, yeah, I saw you recommend Tell Me I'm Worthless at some point on Twitter. Um, and I looked it up and I, yeah, it wasn't in the US, but I'm so glad to hear that Nightfire has picked it up. That's very exciting. Nightfire, please send me a copy, please. Brilliant. <laughs> um, oh, someone else has jumped, jumped on the Silly Goose question train. What cryptid do you think would be your long-term partner slash life partner? And which cryptid is your hot but toxic ex? That's a really good question. <laughs> a really good question. So I feel like, I could have something really lasting and meaningful with Mothman. 
He's quiet. He's soft and velvety. He keeps to himself and does his own thing. He would permit me my independence, I feel. He just, I feel a kind of kinship with Mothman. Like I too would love to sit on top of a telephone pole and not talk to anyone. <laughs> when it comes to my toxic ex though, that's a tough question. I think my worst ex is most like a chupacabra, like just this sort of mangy little thing that sucks the blood out of small animals. Yeah. yeah. Just a, hor a horrible thing you don't want in your barn. <laughs> you know what's funny is my, my immediate impulse when I read that question was Mothman. And I don't know what I bet you said that. I was like, oh, so I couldn't have articulated it as clearly, but I also feel like Mothman would speak when necessary. This Mothman would be like, something bad is about to happen. You need to know about it. But other than that, I'm just going to mind my own business. You know, I'm not, I don't need to be here. <laughs> Mothman has good vibes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mothman has really good I just shockingly bought myself Mothman like underwear, which I, I got like, this is how I know that like the algorithm has me pegged because I just got this like ad for like great high-waisted underwear that had Mothman on it. And I was like, how did it know? But then of course I bought it like, because that's just, you know, it's in my brain. <laughs> I just know. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Isabella asks, Oh, this is an, this is interesting. Do you view writing as more of a release or a reflection? If either, I heard Raven Lalani, who wrote Luster, describes writing as an exorcism. I would say that it's it's a release. I'm constantly having ideas. I have ideas for books every single day of my life, and it it needs to come out very much. I think to me though writing is always first and foremost a job. I have to sit down and get the words onto the page or I don't get to live inside. <laughs> and I think it's important not to mysticize writing, not to make it seem like something magical. Um, no offense intended to Neil Gaiman and his love of the magic of stories, but I think you need a worker's attitude. And I've had a job for most of my life. I've worked in car washes and furniture warehouses and nursing homes and daycare centers. I've worked in kitchens and on grounds crews. I've been a sex worker. Writing is another job and it happens to be a job that I really love and where I can express myself in ways that other jobs wouldn't let me, but it's a job. I love it. That's a great answer. Um, yeah, I feel like that, that desire to mythologize is so intense. And like, I think in some ways it is like weird, like there is something kind of so weird about writing that is sort of like, and at least for me, there's something about that exists like outside of the plan but also you know like but also it's like right it's like you are actually like, this is a living that you're doing and I think right. I love that I love that demystification of it that's actually really lovely um okay so it's age 56 I'm gonna ask you two more questions um one is that um I have been it's so you had several questions about your cover um which I I will admit before I knew anything about you I saw that cover on Twitter and I was like, I was like, it was like a, like, <laughs> you're probably wondering how I got here. And I was just like, and I was like staring at the cover being like, what is this book? Like, I want to know everything about this book. Um, so yeah, can you talk about your cover a little bit? So the cover was my editing editorial team's brainchild. Um, and it is the work of sculptor Sarah Sitkin, who did a lot of the design work for Channel Zero, which is a fantastic horror series uh, that was on sci-fi for a couple of years before it tragically got canceled. And I, I love this cover so much. I've like never in my life been so excited as I was when I saw it for the first time. It's a cover that makes people flinch that makes them cross their legs. There have been so many 
literary or literary adjacent covers over the years that have coyly looked like a vagina. And this was like, I'll see that and raise you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Um, I just, yeah, it's perfect. Um, so then a question that people have asked, but also I wanted to ask you, because I've seen like little snippets of it on Twitter, but like, what are you working on now? What's coming next for you in terms of your writing? So my next novel with Nightfire will be The Cuckoo. And <laughs> it's about a group of queer teens who in the 1990s are sent to a conversion therapy camp in Utah. And once they get there, they slowly begin to realize that something at the camp is making copies of the campers. And the copies are cis and straight and well-behaved and they're being sent home to the parents. Are, are you done with it? Can I read it? <laughs> I'm going to copy soon, I promise. <laughs> Yes, excellent. Um, oh my God, that's so exciting. That's incredibly exciting. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, all right. Thanks, Nightfire. Thank you for making this possible. <laughs> it's very exciting. Thank you so much, Carmen. And thank you, Brooklyn Books. Oh of course. Thank you both so much. That was one of the best events that we've had in so long. This is long. truly, I will say this chat, <laughs> the chat here, I want to preserve this for all of time. This chat is absolutely fucking incredible. I've been like I'm watching out of the corner of my eye and it's like a magical, magical thing. So thanks everybody. <laughs> everybody is so active and just like totally plugged in. It's so great. I can seriously listen to the two of you like talk about just everything for the next like two hours. I'm so sorry. We have to end. Uh, thank you, Gretchen, so much for this and congratulations on the book. And Carmen, thank you so much for being uh, for being here tonight. Um, if anybody out there um, still doesn't have a copy of Gretchen's book, um, you can get it on the Eventbrite page where you register for this event. You can also go to brooklinebooksmith.com at our online shop, um, or you can just come on into the store. We have a bunch of Carmen's books. We have Gretchen's book. I just put on our just arrived paperback table this morning. It is featured um, right in the front of the store. So please come on and grab a copy if you don't have one yet. Um, but yeah, that's uh, thank you all so much for coming. And again, thank you both. Thank you so much for having me. Carmen, thank yes. you for doing this with me. Oh my God, it was my absolute pleasure. Thanks in advance for sending me that new book. I'm very excited. And yes, thank you for this incredible, this just, this book is so special and I can't wait to see it like blow everything up. So thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Have a Bye, great everybody. night.